Rick is um, both a local and a national treasure uh, as he uh, is someone who um, really brings perspective to media that might be forgotten. Uh, films, images, uh, sounds, and now really uh, history, a local history, but also uh, of national importance, uh, as so often can happen in the Bay Area. Um, so um, I'll, I'll bring him right up here, but I just want to mention, so he doesn't have to, that uh, one of his other projects, the Prellinger Library, uh, prellingerlibrary.org, uh, they are a private library open to the public. Uh, all of you should go. They're working to double their hours and to make it go from being, you know, funded by them themselves to being also community funded. So take a look at the fundraiser that they're doing. Go to prellingerlibrary.org for that information. And a uh, big round of applause now for Rick Prellinger. Um, Michael, thank you for that generous and unsolicited announcement. Um, thanks to the bar for the cappuccino, which arrived just in time. And um, thank you all for coming. So this is a little bit of a uh, something different. Have any of you seen the earlier incarnation of this talk? Macro City. Okay, so there's a little bit of you. Two of you know what you're getting into. Um, this is something I've been interested in and working on for a long time, but it may not quite be what you expect. So I'm interested in the history of communications infrastructure, especially infrastructure that's not um, visible to the unstudied eye. And you know, the kind of infrastructure that you can't easily see goes back a long way. You might even go as far as, uh, might even say as far back as latitude and longitude. But for most of us, when we think of infrastructure, we think of, of stone, of concrete, of iron, bridges, railroads, aqueducts, pipelines, roads, piers, massive stuff. And you know, while um, communications themselves are often invisible and typically fairly weightless, they're enabled by physical networks that take up a lot of space and also absorb a lot of investment. They possess materiality, the majesty of materiality and also sometimes the inconvenience of materiality. So today, um, I'm going to talk about the history of communications infrastructure, mostly in San Francisco, um, to a certain extent in the Bay Area, both the hardware and a little bit about the kind of messages that they've transmitted over many years. And I'm going to especially focus, this talk could be a day, and it's already stretching, it's ballooning. And you'll see there's some things I'm conspicuously ignoring. And you, of course, you can bring that up in Q&A and shame me. But I'm going to focus on <laughs> telephones and radio and some other kinds of communication that wind in and out of the chronology. Um, what I think, rather than a complete map, really this is a visual and somewhat audible run through of some of the history and try to extrapolate outward to some questions that we might ask about infrastructure and about communications um, and hope to get a, a conversation going. So how would we communicate in the days before telephones? We could write letters, we could call um, a messenger, the archetypal telegraph boy, perhaps from the American District Telegraph, a mythical figure in 19th century um, literature and culture. Um, telegraph lines first connected San Francisco with San Jose, and with Stockton, Sacramento, the interior, and Marysville, starting in 1853. And that same year, a wire was extended from Point Lobos over the dunes to Telegraph Hill and to the Merchants Exchange so that news of incoming ships could arrive downtown instantaneously. And then to LA in, in 1859. And the reason was so that San Francisco newspapers could get news that came in on the stages into Los Angeles. And then briefly news from the Pony Express to Carson City, and then to SF via Telegraph in 1861, Transcom Telegraph. And so 1877, we first get telephone service in San Francisco. This is a, a tumultuous year in American history. Unemployment, drought, strikes, uh, violent strikes and anti-Chinese violence, strikes nationwide. And there's a funny correlation between, um, oftentimes, between social and economic unrest 
and the deployment of communication systems. And you can see why the phone was attractive to captains of industry, because it could pass on information instantaneously without mediation, without anybody else in between except maybe an operator. But at the beginning, uh, you couldn't get the operator directly. If you wanted to call somebody, you first had to signal your telegraph office, which happened to be in the same room as the switchboard and they would tap your call out on the tape, and then the telegraph operator would pass the tape to a switchboard operator who would connect your line to the line you wanted, kind of like booking a session on the internet in advance. And until, 19, until 1880, the operators were teenage boys, but their language was considered unseemly. They'd say things like, hello, hello, what do you want? Are you through? Well, why don't you hang up? They, these, you know. And so they, they phased out the boys. Um, 1887, this is housetop wiring. We're a little, little bit bright here, but most of the downtown roofs in San Francisco had frames supporting telephone, telegraph, and messenger wires. And in residential neighborhoods, they just nailed boards to the roof and projected them out from the buildings, and wires were out in the open to allow for um, inspection. This was not very resilient, as you could imagine. And rooftop wiring, people would hang laundry up on it. Or if people went up on the roof, they would trip over the wires and the phones would go out. And so the telephone pole was introduced in the 1880s, gradually replacing the more informal um, structures. But you know, San Francisco was dusty and wet dust that was dust plus fog blew into wires and shorted them out. And usually by noon that evaporated, but it was often hard to make calls in the morning. And, and so they figured out how to insulate cables. It's really kind of interesting, this sort of nature, physical um, interaction. In 1886, they build the branch exchanges in the city, and we get underground cables. In 1892, downtown, which is why in the famous Market Street film that you've probably all seen a million times, um, you don't see telephone wiring. It's already underground. And there's constant, constant innovation, a lot of reinvestment. In the 1880s, all the Edison manufactured phones are replaced by Bell telephones. And then the long distance telephone set, the set that is interoperable with a network that um, amplifies, is, is introduced. So by the 1890s, a lot of businesses have telephones in San Francisco, but the general public um, sees them as frivolous and expensive, um, kind of like the way cell phones were before about 1990. Um, Pactel introduced four-party lines and 10-party lines in 1894. They were much cheaper, and a few more residences subscribed. And in 1896, they came up with kind of the killer innovation, which was called the kitchen telephone, which only cost 50 cents a month. And you could call out to order food and other supplies for the house, but the phone had no bells, and so you couldn't call into it. It was outgoing calls only. Um, a little bit like the one-way internet. And plus there were 20 other phones on your line, so it was frequently busy. And the idea was to, to groom customers, you know, to get them to, to buy one-way service and then want two-way, and that kind of worked. So the quake and fire um, in 06 pretty much destroyed. Oh, you really can't see this. That's too bad. But here's one of the very early um, temporary telephone directories uh, from April 28. And it's kind of interesting. Within 10 days, they had uh, temporary wires strung to link the key, um, uh, the key especially the emergency um, operations. This is from October uh, 1906. I love how Engine 11 at 15th Avenue South, which is... Um, later became an alphabetical street in the Bayview section is Butchertown 18. You know, there was the Butchertown phone exchange. Um, but by 1907, they've, it's normal. And as a result, um, you know, downtown was mostly destroyed. A lot of people relocated to the Western Edition and to the Mission. And about 100,000 people left. 66,000 moved out to where land was cheaper. And as a result, the telephone couldn't really follow. It was hard to um, build out as quickly as people were moving. Um, and then the phone becomes national. It's tremendously expensive. Uh, to call long distance, but it becomes possible. This is 1895. This is one of the prizes in our library, the National Telephone Directory. These were issued until 1911, and it's this incredible directory of sort of the ruling circles 
of the country. And in fact, in the DC page, if you look sort of in the middle, you see Alexander Graham Bell is listed. You could call him at Washington 32. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Um, this book goes from Maine to St. Louis, and beyond St. Louis, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't call nationally anymore. Um, before the 1890s, we had the Chinese telephone exchange at 742 Washington. Um, this, you've, uh, there's a lot of uh, mystique that's grown up around it. These women um, pretty much worked from memory. People did have numbers in the China exchange, but basically within that exchange, everything was handled manually and they remembered the subscribers. Uh, some of you may have seen the, the Chinese uh, ideographic telephone books that were published at least through the late 40s. They often show up on eBay. Um, there was also, and nobody really knows much about this, but there was the Pekin Exchange in downtown Oakland as well, a very small localized um, exchange. How about um, the telephone as a broadcast medium? This is kind of like AT&T and Comcast, you know, going into the, the programming business. In 1913, about 10 companies called the Telephone Herald started up in the U.S. The Oakland company seems to have been an epic fail. It did a demo in Capwell's downtown, and it doesn't ever seem to have built out. But you know, this worked. In 1881 in Paris, there was a telephone broadcast system that used double lines for stereophonic sound. Um, in Budapest, the system started up in 1893 and actually ran until 1944. It was a, um, an alternate, really, to the radio system. Of course, you'd really, You'd, sometimes you'd have a special set with a speaker, but typically you sat with something up against your ear. I mean, this may seem laughable, um, but I think that what's interesting about it is that um, there was a realization that that copper network, once you'd set up a telephone infrastructure, that you could repurpose it, that you could do something else with it. You know, think, uh, think dial-up. So um, this is our 100th anniversary of the PPIE, and the year before, in May 1914, they put on something called the Ball of All Nations. And this is just wonderful. I wish that we'd reenacted this as part of the anniversary. They built a hidden wire network under the floor, and it was connected with copper nails that were set close apart, facing um, up to the top of the, 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 the surface of the floor. And the spouse of a telephone employee wore shoes with copper soles. And, and then wires ran up through her clothing, just like me, um, to a telephone set. And then she would invite people to dance. And she would ask her dancing partners, who would you like to talk with? And then a switchboard operator in the background listened in on everything that was said. And whenever she heard a name, she rushed through a call on special lines. So, I mean, you know, wow. Um, <laughs> July 1914, the first transcontinental phone call. And this was, you couldn't drive across country without a lot of hassle. But they did, um, they, they got the lines finished in 1914 and they celebrated January 25, 1915. Bell said in New York, Mr. Watson, come here, I want you. Mr. Watson, sitting in San Francisco, said it'll take me five days. <laughs> and the call took 23 minutes to connect. Um, 1915 also, the first transmission of speech across the Atlantic by radio telephone. This was commercialized from New York to London and later SF to London in 1927. I think it was $65 for the first three minutes and multiplied by, I don't know, 14 or something, just insanely expensive. This ad is kind of interesting. Um, basically, it says that the telephone best serves those who have become one with us in speech that you have to speak the same language to talk on the phone. And of course, this is obvious in a way, although now we wouldn't. Now AT&T, of course, advertises its 140 language interpreting system. But, you know, there's an interesting connection with the nativism of the period. Um, this ad is from uh, 1920. More transcontinental routes open, 1923, 1927, by the late 20s, early 30s. I don't know exactly when. There's four routes. They're redundant. They can route if um, the Sierra Nevada is out with the snowfalls you know, over, over the pass. You can route from Salt Lake City to LA and then back up. Long distance rates from 1922, 
multiplied by about 14. So a daytime call from San Francisco to New York, 1650 for the first three minutes, multiplied by 14. This was not, uh, you know, this was like, uh, like uh, uh, Richard Branson's, you know, galactic, Virgin Galactic. Um, late 1920s to 1930s, we see customer dialing. You know, this was a huge educational issue. Um, but it obviously saved the phone company a tremendous amount in labor. And it's a step forward in customer-powered infrastructure. And in a lot of ways, you know, um, I'm attracted to the contrarian idea that the, the telephone was maybe a more quote-unquote revolutionary invention in the internet uh, may have been simply because it was the first time, especially with the direct dialing, that there was unmediated communication between, from individual to individual, and that's just a tremendous change um, in its time. Systemically, it may not have been as, as strong a change to the internet, but I think it, it, it's historically perhaps um, under, underrated. Oh, I'll go see over there. You finish your coffee, John. I'll answer it. It's probably the mailman. John, it's from Sally. She says the baby has the measles. Oh, dear. Well, now, measles, that's not so serious. All kids get them sooner or later. John Warren, you know Ruthie is only 14 months old. Poor little dear. I'm worried. Well, if you're worried, why don't you call her up? You've got her number in that little book of yours. No, it's just about 8 o'clock in San Francisco. They'll be up. You know, I believe I will. Go ahead. Call her. You'll feel better. sure it isn't too early out there? Oh, no, it's, it's 11 o'clock here. That means it's 8 o'clock out there. Hello? Sally? Sally, this is Mother. Simple, wasn't it? She just picked up her telephone and dialed her daughter in San Francisco, California. In a matter of seconds, she is talking with her. Simple, and yet you are seeing the results of many, many years of coordinated effort in research engineering and operating experience. Back when we were area code 318. I, I'm surprised that more people haven't studied these exchange maps. The expansion is actually quite interesting. Um, and that's a little much for us, but for now we can remember the wonderful names, you know, Atwater, Douglas, Axbrook, Jordan, Klondike, etc., Bayview. Skyline. Um, and then uh, this is how operators completed long distance calls using this keyboard I'm about to show you. And here are the tones. And um, remember these tones. They're called multi frequency signaling. You remember how you would hear that when you'd make a call and, and you'd hear that? This is the keyboard, um, actually, from an Oregon switchboard, and this is what the, um, what the operator would use. We're going to come back to that. Uh, there's treasures in phone books. These are the old address phone books, and this is a picture of 24th Street in San Francisco in, uh, what would that be, 1956? And it's an incredible way of thinking about how neighborhoods have changed. Um, this is a lot of people come to us in the library to see those. Interesting also to see, even in relatively prosperous times, how unevenly telephone service was distributed um, in San Francisco. So another kind of telephone is, um, is our fire alarm box system. This actually goes back to 1865. 
and the terminal point for fire alarms um, was opened in 1915 next to 1011, uh, 1011 Turk, um, the, the, currently the Department of Emergency Management Building. And this was kind of a primitive telegraph system, and I won't go into details, but if somebody pulled a box at 25th and Connecticut, the digits 2615 um, would be marked on a moving paper tape. And then from there, uh, uh, this would tap out in fire stations all around the city, and then engines would um, respond. That one th the thing about the alarm boxes that are really interesting is that they're just insanely resilient. There's still 2,040 fire boxes on the streets, and they continue to function throughout Loma Prieta. Um, they're maintained, I think, mostly by one man still. Um, <laughs> And uh, it's, it's a neat system. 80% of the calls are false alarms. 20% are legit, but it's um, inherently hardened against disaster and it does save lives. We also have the mayor's emergency telephone system, uh, Red Phones, which um, is independent of the telephone companies. It's designed to operate during power failures. It's 100 years old. There's 460 of these boxes, and I think each rookie cop still gets a key to them. And these phones are in the mayor's house, and in the supervisor's house, and in fire stations around the city. And if we run into a situation where we lose power, and we lose radio systems, and we lose the internet, this plus radio hams is, is what's going to coordinate um, emergency response and disaster relief in San Francisco. So when you see one of these, they're not just uh, antiques. Um, mobile phones, which we, of course, take for granted. The first were in the 40s, but there were only a few channels. This is what one of them looked like in every city. Everything was arranged through the operator, and you had to push to talk at the very beginning, right? Half duplex. You couldn't speak and listen at the same time. It gets better in 1965, but the limits in the system still mean only a few hundred people. And then we start to see the cell plan, and I think you kind of basically know about this. The whole idea is that you divide a territory into little cells, with localized transmitters and you hand off as, as people or vehicles move and so you can reuse frequencies. And it uses a lot of, um, uh, of computer power and there's a lot of bandwidth to, to backhaul the signal back from the remote sites to the, um, to the switching stations, but it's still super efficient. And of course it took the world by storm. 1983, these beautiful Dynatax, there's one on eBay here for 525, buy it now. Um, the phones that we use now are, are just about all GSM, uh, 1990s. Text messages we first see in the country in 1993. Cell phone roaming was terrible. They used to put out these books, instructions if you went to San Francisco, how to dial into the system and how to arrange your billing. And these coverage maps, which are, uh, to say the least, visionary. <laughs> Lots of education was required. This is from the late 80s, early 90s. Um, kind of funny. <laughs> and then cell phone etiquette, 2001. This is an in Pac Bell Wireless put this out about attitudes and behavior. Americans would rather visit the dentist than sit next to somebody in the movies talking on the phone. Um, just a little uh, apropos of nothing. If you visit Lawrence Livermore Lab, you've got to lock your phone up in these little self-storages outside the security perimeter. Paging, you know, people joke about paging now, but it is an inc incredibly efficient system for multi multicasting messages. It's used now in the, by public safety people, a little bit still in business. In the year 2000, there were nine major paging companies in San Francisco. Um, it's, it's, it's worth investigating. So every organizational system breeds its own kind of deconstruction, breeds its own kind of transgression. This is early phone freaking, playing with the infrastructure. Remember the operator's multi-frequency keyboard? This is a blue box that allows um, uh, you to, to mimic those tones yourself, to seize a line by hitting the clear key up in the upper right, and then you can pretty much own the system. This was my blue box that I bought in 1972 from Wozniak and Jobs in Berkeley, and who came around the dorms uh, to sell them. And we had a wild demo evening as we called around the world. Steve Jobs called 
Dr. Arthur Janov, who wrote The Primal Scream, because he was obsessed with him and his daughter. And, you know, and, and wised off operators in the British uh, telephone system and so on. It was, it was my first direct contact at being in touch with a network that simulated a kind of a life. And I wish, I tried to find this was recorded, but the man that recorded it, his two-year-old, re-recorded the tape. Anyway, it's now at the Computer History Museum. There it is. Um, and then another kind of phone freaking in um, El Cerrito. There's a lot of talk these days about what's wrong with the younger generation. So here's an item on the credit side. A group of five teenagers who have organized their own telephone company, put it together from surplus and junked equipment into a smoothly functioning network that serves 28 subscribers. They string wires and install phones themselves, too. So far, the service is free. The young businessmen engineers behind it all have put up the little cash they needed, and the still-growing system already has two exchanges in Kensington and El Cerrito. Think of those lucky homes with a private wire to handle those marathon teenage phone calls. There's community service for you. Holy shit. <laughs> I... I think it's great. We should do this in San Francisco. Um, so radio is as old as the universe. It passes through um, everything, including our bodies. We're still hearing cosmic radio noise from the Big Bang. And um, added to what used to be this ambient presence of the natural world, we now have a chaotic collection of human-produced vectors. Every built-up area is blanketed by emissions from powerful broadcast transmitters. This is Mount Wilson, this is not San Francisco. Extremely high power transmitters. Lower power stations are usually building, mounted. AM and shortwave broadcasters like KGO use towers that are sited in areas of high ground conductivity, such as wetlands. Um, this is a beautiful building near the Dumbarton Bridge. And then there's this bewildering fabric of, of low power transmissions from the Wi-Fi chips and the cellular radios we all carry around to the RFID tags on um, library books and passports and pallets and Costco. Those are typically passive rather than they don't transmit out, but they are pulled by transmitters. Family radios, portable public safety radios, radio hams with Morse code and then voice and then music, and then in 1909, somewhat disputed, but we would hear the first um, voice broadcast radio transmissions from San Jose, which later would evolve into KCBS, which um, traces its, its uh, history back to 1909. Broadcasting pioneers in the 20s, this is a tiny, narrow slice of the spectrum, and it's chaotic, it's not well regulated until 1927. All sorts of people and businesses go on the air, at the, initially mostly on the same channel, and it's, it's, it's chaos. Um, it gets cleaned up by 1935, broadcast radio is much better coordinated. Uh, the point here, is that these clear channels, like if you look at 830 KOA or if you look at um, 700 WLW, these are clear channel stations that could be heard all over the country. AM was really a national medium to a great extent. It becomes mainstream. People rely on radio to fulfill a vast spectrum of needs and desires in the same way that they would later rely on TV. And as far as TV is concerned, Philo T. Farnsworth, at 202 Green Street, our um, transgressive pioneer who tried to shove it to RCA for many, many years, sent a single straight line from one room to another in his lab. Next year, he demos his straight line for his backers who are anxious to see some money coming back in, so he transmits a dollar sign. And in 1929, he sends pictures of people, including a three and a half inch image of his wife whose eyes are closed because the lights are so blinding. So it's great to think of these weak signals that barely radiated past a room as a historically significant peak on the historical spectrum graph. And by the 1930s, we have a really sophisticated wireless infrastructure in the Bay Area. And like the Bay Area, the wireless, the spectrum becomes militarized in the 40s. There's naval transmitters everywhere, Alameda, Skaggs Island up in the delta. There's a vast amount of traffic passing through. 
This is in 1948. This is called Homograph, which is a local radio guide for the Bay Area. And what's so cool about it is it takes an integrated view. So here's your mainstream AM, and there's your early FM. Here's shortwave, and they even list the police frequencies. You know, the, it's this whole idea that of, um, uh, of, of looking at radio holistically. Central 103. Adam 103, you calling headquarters? Uh, yeah, I got a 418, the 400 block of Broadway Street. This one, 400 Broadway, 3 Adam 103 has a 418, a unit to 1025, 400 Broadway. 3 Adam 4, two blocks away. Adam 4, two blocks away. Units are all covering each other. Out of four, did you say you were 97 on Broadway? 10-4, that's the Mibu Head Garden. Mibu Head Garden, 10-4. Three out of four. Out of four. Code four, sufficient help. We have a code four, sufficient help by three out of four at 400 Broadway. Code four, sufficient help. Any units not there? 10-22. So this is what police radio used to sound like. This is July 26, 1979, and there's trouble at the Mabuhai Gardens <laughs> on, uh, on 440 Broadway. Um, this is an old school system. It will skip. I've heard it in Connecticut. It's still, it's still there in case our um, fancy trunk radio system breaks down. It's got kind of a pure sound to it. We'll come back to this in a little bit. I'm just a word, and I'm not really doing broadcast as I should, but here's the TV picture in 1957. One courageous UHF station, KSAN TV, didn't last. Um, the region, we didn't get TV until after World War II, but it built out fairly quickly. This is, uh, there are people in this room who could talk much more authoritatively about the history of television infrastructure than, than I can, but I'm really interested in useful radio. Um, and in 1964, we have this, uh, you know, American cities begin to be racked by civil unrest, call it what you like, and money begins to flow from the feds to the locals to fund riot control equipment, to modernize communication systems. And so manufacturers perfect this handheld walkie-talkie so that every cop can have his own radio. Even in 1973, in the first year of Streets of San Francisco, there aren't many radios, and even they have the kind you have to stretch out the telescoping antenna. You know, this took a while, but um, the old-time two-way system, two radio systems are replaced by fancier radio systems, and the existence of communications triggers an interest in intercepting them. And so Radio Shack mass markets these patrolman radios, so you can listen to the cops. And then uh, in, a, in a few years, even more sophisticated uh, radios like scanners are introduced. In the 1970s, we begin to see the proliferation of microwave dishes around the city, and there's some environmental concern. The famous book was The Zapping of America by Paul Brodeur, first serialized in The New Yorker. Um, and there were some studies, San Francisco was an early test bed for studies on non-ionizing radiation. Um, and this is, uh, for some people, still a very controversial issue. A lot of people are, are um, unhappy and, and, and feel sickened by living close to cell base stations. Some people are, um, uh, feel sickened by their Wi-Fi, and there's a lot of people that are concerned about smart meters. The science doesn't seem to be very conclusive at this point. Um, but ultimately, you know, we carry devices on our bodies, and fewer and fewer people really worry about it. Um, Interesting how antennas begin to re retreat into the background of the urban landscape. We no longer see them. This is a fire in South of Market, and the TV stations have um, raised their, uh, their microwave dishes to point to Sutro. But um, this is one sort of rare moment where, where uh, aside from Mount Sutro, where the um, antennas are conspicuous. 1973, we have the co-location of many TV and FM stations at Sutro. Uh, we could do, again, there's people here who know uh, much more about Sutro than I do. It's, it's, it's technologically and increasingly aesthetically uh, a, a fascinating, fascinating structure. Um, there's also San Bruno Mountain, very interesting place to hike. Um, but let me go back a little bit to this notion of surveillance and counter-surveillance. Be advised that we got a phone call and Uh, have capability to monitor uh, and uh, utilize scanners, so be circumspect on uh, giving direction.
directions, getting where you're going there, okay? Yeah, 10 four. Okay, I won't say where that came from, but um, <laughs> by the late 1970s and early 80s, it's the heyday of radio monitoring, of um, signal intelligence and traffic analysis. Do people know what traffic analysis is? So if you have uh, radio signals or you have internet traffic, you have messages being passed and you can't necessarily pick up what those messages are saying. Maybe they're encrypted, maybe they're scrambled, whatever. Maybe they're obscure. Traffic analysis is looking at the metadata. How many sources? What direction are they coming from? Um, what, what do you know about the characteristics of the signal that help you understand valuable information even if you don't know what the message is? So that is um, in situ surveillance of suspected spies under foreign diplomatic cover in the late 1970s. This is the FBI in Pacific Heights, probably looking at the Soviets near the consulate. We wouldn't hear this now. Now it would be completely encrypted. We would hear static, you know, just white noise, or we wouldn't hear anything at all. And this is a perfect example of a signal which is essentially, you're just hearing these these uh, alphabetic coordinates that probably respond to some kind of a map. Um, but the traffic analysis can still tell you a great thing about that. So this becomes pervasive for sensitive communications. And in 1986, a law called ECPA, Electronic Communications Privacy, is passed. It's illegal to listen to cell phones. It's illegal to decode or decrypt digital transmissions. Um, and that law stands today. Here is one of the more interesting buildings in San Francisco. This is the Department of Emergency Management at 1011 Turk, where I was um, graciously given a tour this very morning. So these slides are very, very fresh. They haven't faded yet. Um, this is the public safety dispatch. And I was asked not to you know, um, show people's faces there because people are, are conscious of their privacy. But there's a console for each. Um, this is the police area, which is closest to the supervisors in case they need coordination. But A8 is the Richmond District handheld. A7 is the, well, they call it that, but A7 is um, main dispatch for, uh, for um, gosh, Richmond, Taraval, and uh, where's my brain? Anyway, the west side of the city. So these are incredibly sophisticated consoles, and this is what somebody sees a 9-11 call taker, and then a radio dispatcher. This is bogus. You see it's made out to Fred Flintstone. It's a training screen because we can't reveal any um, private information, but this was done this morning. And so all of this is typed in, and this rather sophisticated um, system, which is called a, a CAD, Computer Assisted Dispatch, keeps track of status and assigns case numbers and so on. It's really, really interesting, but this is part of the background. Um, they also see maps, and they see certain sensitive locations are marked here. Um, so this is a, uh, a customized uh, uh, view, a GIS view for public safety dispatchers. And they also do triage. If you make a medical call um, and you complain that you think there's a stroke, these are questions that are asked, and then ultimately um, something is put together for dispatch so that the, the first responders will know what to do. Um, unlike some cities in San Francisco, medical dispatchers are not paramedics, they're civilians, but this is a, a medically developed um, system that, that helps to, to triage ahead of time. We have a really complicated system, in a trunk system in San Francisco. It's getting old. It's analog, it's no longer um, it's going to be supported. And so by 2018, there's a hope that they'll have a fancy new digital system put in. Um, these are all the police channels that are used. So we don't use, what's interesting is it's a software thing now. In the old days, fire used to have a channel. Police in the north side had one channel, police, and it's not done that way. Now it's all done in software. And so talk groups, which are sort of virtual paths that are shared, are, are set aside. Um, I won't go into, this is analysis of, of who's busiest. It's really fascinating. It turns out the library is one of the busiest, the library channel is one of the busiest on the San Francisco system. This is um, what they're expecting. I think I don't want to take the time. 
Um, interoperability is a really big uh, issue. You'll see it in the newspapers, even it's made its way into the public press, because after 9-11, it was the fire and the police didn't talk to one another, and this is one of the reasons it is said why so many firefighters died in the collapse of the World Trade Center. Um, my contention is that interoperability is not a technical problem. It's not going to be solved by throwing billions and billions of dollars of expensive technology um, at, a, at the problem. It's a cultural problem. Uh, typically, people in different departments don't like to share information. Uh, and this has been a perennial problem. And so we need to think about how that's all going to work. It's a real, I think, cultural issue. Um, so 1990 is the beginning of massive data traffic. It begins as a trickle. This is from 2000, and this is PalmNet. Did any of you have Palm Pilots? For, the, for your expanded plan, you got 150 kilobytes, which was 90 messages a month. We should all restrict ourselves to 90 messages a month and make them matter. Um, the question that this begs is, can we build um, sufficient infrastructure to support the heavy bandwidth that people are jumping to use? Um, especially when a lot of people don't want to live next to the transmitters that they're using. Um, but it's a really interesting question, you know. Um, a lot of people think spectrum is scarce. Spectrum is sold for huge amounts of money. Um, but there's argument that, of course, spectrum, if it was assigned on the fly and it was used in a much more, uh, if it was assigned virtually, that that scarcity doesn't exist. And we may have to figure out even more sophisticated ways of pushing a lot of data through. Um, but we don't really know yet. Here's our smart meter. Um, a lot of people are scared of smart meters. Uh, they either use Wi-Fi or they use uh, 915 megahertz on licensed spectrums. They talk to these. It's a, I guess it's a mesh network, is it, smart meters? And um, so a, a bunch of different uh, uh, units form a mesh network. These talk to one another, and ultimately this information is transmitted back centrally. So some questions. Um, the great infrastructural change of our time is moving from fixed infrastructures to mobile. But mobile really isn't mobile because it takes massive and often expensive fixed infrastructure to enable. We can miniaturize infrastructure, we can make it smaller, and we can build it into the edges of the network. You know, the whole idea of the internet that it's smart at the edges and it's dumb in the center. But you know, quite often providers of bandwidth or other rivalrous goods and services don't want to give up control. You know, we have the same issue with uh, home-based solar systems, which in many states you can't plug into the grid um, so that when the power goes off, you go off because they don't want you to pump a lot of electricity in and endanger uh, utility workers. Not every cell phone scriber is allowed to tether use their phone as a, as a modem. Spectrum is highly regulated. Certain users are subsidized. Broadcast, uh, broadcasters pay for their licenses, but they have a lot more spectrum. It's cheaper. Should we open up spectrum to equipment that can jump all over the place and use it more efficiently? Should we have more unlicensed spectrum? The Wi-Fi boom was huge. We could do it again. But some people um, are going to find their holdings demonetized. Um, there's a steady move towards deregulation, but it isn't inevitable. There's an uncertain... Uh, situation regarding privacy. Um, we used to have party line phones, we used to have telegrams, we used to have postcards, pretty transparent. Now we have encrypted GSM phones, so we can hear each other, but government agencies and a lot of corporations can hear us or they can look at our metadata. This is festering, it's unresolved. So a few trajectories. Um, a movement from radio links that move from the center to the periphery, to virtual and mediated links, like trunk systems or like telephones, where there isn't a, a, a fixed telephone line between me and you. We use a phone line as long as we need one. Same way with, with trunk systems. We see uh, mesh networks that are pretty autonomous. We see a lot of silos. We see systems that don't interoperate with one another. There's the old hardware-based radios that you have to tune to a specific frequency. 
or software-defined radios, which can jump all over the place. We'll talk a little bit more about them. Systems get more complex. A lot of communications infrastructure, there was a huge covert communications infrastructure in the Cold War that mostly we know about now. We're beginning to, re to replicate a uh, sort of dark world of, of covert infrastructure on a, on a really major level. And then there's these networks that can monitor movement and behavior. And this isn't just you know, evil government agencies. It's, it's, um, it's, uh, it's when you walk into a, uh, a clothing store and um, certain, and, and you know, they do the Bluetooth beacon thing to either collect or to send information to your phone. Do we have a right to know? Do we have a right to peer into them? We might call for a certain kind of disclosure. Um, but you know, fundamentally, we don't even know anymore what agencies are out there. This is a really, really interesting question. Um, in the 80s, I did research for, I did a two-way radio guide for New York City when I lived there, and I found that there were 32 types of city, county, and state police in New York. And then I didn't even try to do the feds. And now I would imagine there's probably double that. And I think that some of these agencies don't even have names or their private contract. Um, what networks don't we know about? There's video feeds, they're often aggregated places. There's, um, we've been reading lately about aerial observation, the FBI planes. This isn't so secret, it's very easy to, to figure that kind of stuff out. Um, mobile observation platforms, the automatic license plate readers, um, face and gate recognition. Apparently your gate is much more a, a, you know, a unique identifier than your face. Um, we haven't read very much about that yet. I'm really interested in the Internet of Things, you know, when everything is tagged and, um, and either they're active tags or they're passive tags that are polled all over the place, we're suddenly going to see billions and billions and billions of new um, emitters. And uh, what does that information mean when you aggregate it? It's a fascinating and, to me, still rather murky uh, radio landscape. And then, obviously, cell phone metadata observation. Uh, if you look uh, as you... Um, as you uh, travel along the highways, you can see antennas that look at, at your, um, what do we call it, fast track here, to see where you're going. And there's a lot of people who look at um, cell phone metadata just to, to track aggregate movement of people. That's how Google can correct its, its maps. And, and you know, when the highway clears up ahead, suddenly it isn't red on your phone anymore. And the latency is down to just a matter of seconds. One point I'd like to kind of, um, I am moving towards a, a, a close here, but one of the points I'd really like to stress is that we've got a really stable communications infrastructure, but it's also fragile. And I'm really curious about why um, we have this existing landline phone infrastructure that's extremely robust. It's been in, in service for a long, long time, but people don't want it, and they're giving it up in the name of portability. And they're neglecting the very well-engineered but boring telephone infrastructure for exciting terminals, you know, like my beautiful Android phone. And we're trading portability and convenience for um, uh, resiliency. You know, this phone might be good for a couple hours in a disaster because there isn't going to be a lot of, uh, of uh, battery backup at cell sites, and of course the system's going to be overloaded. Landlines and pagers worked well, broadcast radio worked really well, um, but we, we have all these new platforms, but they're really fragile, and they're more expensive, um, and there's data bloat. So I'm really curious how that's going to happen. We're a little worried about the security and the independence of commercial services. One might, I think certain people might be interested in the rebirth of messengers and couriers and steganography, drones that deliver to, well, you can shoot a drone down, but to verifiable addresses. Um, I'll go past that. So this is the, um, the San Francisco emergency siren system. Uh, you've all heard it go off on Tuesday at, at noon when they do the tests. And this is the map of the current sirens. And um, take a look, just by the way, at the Great Highway in Taraval. I believe it's number, is it 75 or 78? And it's gray, which means um, it's out of service. And in a moment, I'm going to show you why. And here today, I had the great privilege of, of being with a man when he actually activated them for the noon Tuesday test. That's the mouse click that, that, that did it on Tuesday. 
you know, doesn't take much to excite a geek. Um, <clears throat> But they told me um, that they'd pulled the, 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 um, the speakers or the, the, the speakers and sirens at Taraval and Great Highway out of service, and here's why. Because there's a, a red-tailed hawk nesting there. So Megan and I went down and, and took a photograph of it this afternoon, and it's kind of life-affirming. But the question is, they don't know when they can turn it back on because the, um, the hawks will fledge. Uh, but the question is, will other birds move in or will the hawks come back? It's quite an issue. Um, uh, I'd love to see, um, I, again, I don't really want to go into this, but one of the things we need in San Francisco is hyper-local news and information radio with um, nothing but what's happening in San Francisco. I think it would be quite useful. The problem with running over-the-air radio, of course, is your electric bill and um, the cost of a license. Um, community wireless networks, you know, I, I haven't talked, there's people here who could talk about the efforts that are being made right now, but here's a proposal from the 1960s from the Cauliflower newsletter, which was the intercommunal newsletter of hippie communes, and somebody suggested that um, communes, this is what, about 1969 or 68? Somebody suggested that um, they link up a net of CB and business band. They got a little confused, so they could speak all the way from Canada to Mexico. Um, so just to very end very quickly, we need to have a field guide to invisible infrastructure in San Francisco. Here's some of the indicators that we might track, some of the ways that we might use it, some of the tools. Um, I wish somebody would do it here. Somebody took a first stab in New York. Ingrid Burrington made this book um, called Networks of New York, um, but I think we should really do it here, and there's some, a groundswell behind that, and it'd be a neat project. Anyway, um, I'd like to thank you all for your attention, and we have time, I think, for a few Q's and A's. Rick. I I like to think that you got to press the alarm system because you were the 20th caller on the radio station, but I assume that's probably <laughs> I not the didn't case. I press it, but I just, no. I, I watched it. So, uh, you, you mentioned you lived in New York for, for many years before you met here. Do you have a sense, I know you haven't done the same kind of research there, how New York or other cities, are, are there factors that are unique to how things sort of evolved here, D different technologies that caught on faster or... Or, or deeper uh, with the community, or stuck around longer when? It's really hard to do things in New York. You know, the density is incredible. Mm -hmm. The cost of doing things is very high. Um, New York is much more tribal. Information isn't shared. Um, I would have never been able to have the tour that I had today in New York City, because people are much more paranoid and closed. Um, I. It's one of the reasons we're lucky to live in San Francisco. It's still not the most open process, and you know we have a lot of commercial providers who don't talk to anybody for business reasons. But um, we have some challenges here because of the hills and because of the of density. But I think um, you can't really compare. We just don't have that same level of crunch. Uh, who's got a question out there? Right there. That's you. Hey. So that was great. Are you working on part two, which has the internet? I'd love to work on part two. I don't think I'm the best person to work on part two. You know, I've looked at the fiber maps, and I've been to a lot of, um, you know, uh, uh, I've been to peering and colo facilities, but I, I have a lot to learn about that. I think there's other people that will probably do it better. Uh, and I forgot to mention, you know, Rick's going to be sticking around, so please stick around and we'll, we'll keep the conversation going. We'll, we'll only have a couple uh, more questions. And maybe, Rick, you can entice some of these mysterious people that are in the room that know uh, more about some of the infrastructure <laughs> to join into a larger conversation. Well, this is ongoing and it'll get better over time. Great. Um, back, right back there. So the question is the, the networks that were put in in the 90s, uh, phone, net, phone net data, fiber opera net, optic networks, do you know, has, has that been tracked? Does people know what's out there even? I mean, there's a, you know, keeping track of those is a business, and um, people have to know where fiber is buried so that they won't cut it when they dig. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they don't call 811 to do that. But I do think that knowledge is there. It isn't on the open internet for the most part. 
because it's uh, for a bunch of reasons companies don't want to. Fiber is very easy to cut, and I don't think they want uh, you know Joe Public doing that because he's angry. Uh, Alexander Rose, our executive director. seeing at Global Business Network as one of the few people who predicted the demise of the Soviet uh, system was actually the person who tracked uh, penetration of phone networks in uh, oppressive um, government systems. And actually, he said at a certain point of phone penetration, that's when these systems will go down. He predicted when the Soviet system would go down. Um, and so we see kind of echoes of that now in the internet with penetration of things like Twitter and Facebook in the Arab Spring. I wonder, if, have you tracked any of those kind of parallels? Well, you know, um, since I became a professor recently, there's kind of an imperative to try to take a position on these kinds of issues. And all I can say right now is that, you know, when you talk about the Arab Spring or you talk about Turkey or you talk about um, Ferguson, that there's a correlation between um, communication channels and messaging, but I'm not sure there's a causation. And the thing is that the internet, you know, to, to exist, the internet and all the services built on top of it require a steady source of power, reasonably compliant uh, states um, that let it keep going, and um, also, you know, citizen access. And so I don't think that the causation is really established. I do think there's a correlation between being able to, to communicate it's a human right and um, you know, that, that long arc of democracy. But I'm not sure that the long arc of democracy is super democratic right now. It's a different kind of, it's something, it's a, a fusion that's, um, you know, we confuse uh, openness and authoritarianism quite well now. Um, so I, I don't have a, a strong opinion yet. All right. Last question from the bar. Um, you talked a little bit about um, Bay Area in terms of um, radio networks, Wi-Fi networks, silly networks. Um, in my experience in 2001 during the terrorist attacks of 9-11, um, one of the things that I contributed to personally was allowing people at Columbia University and anyone walking by to have free voice over IP access to international um, phone calls. And one of the things that I'm interested in, and I'd love to have your opinion, is if our phone network ever went down here in San Francisco, what kind of network accessibility do you think would be most important here in San Francisco? Could I toss this question to Mike McCarthy? <laughs> Do you want to? Do you want to talk for? Do we, you feel like just explaining that possibility for a minute or two? Sure. Here you go. Yeah. So you should tell who Mike is. I'm Mike. Um, <laughs> so hello everyone. Uh, so I work for the city's uh, Department of Technology, and I've known Rick for a little while. I've definitely appreciated his shows at the Castro every Christmas. Um, and to your point, um, I build uh, community Wi-Fi networks along with uh, Tim Pozar. Um, Round of applause for Tim. Um, and we also have built up public Wi-Fi as sort of a city department. But Tim and I have sort of our own little uh, Tim and Mike network that uh, provides. Uh, Tim and Mike's excellent network. There you go. <laughs> Buy the rights now. Um, that uh, provides free Wi-Fi internet at about 70, 80 sites around the city. And we use unique strands of city fiber that all go back to a building called 200 Paul. 200 Paul is a commercial data center at Paul and Third out in the Bayview. It used to be a, an old Sears warehouse. Um, and, I'm sorry? Macy's. Macy's. Yeah. Clearly Tim knows more. Uh, Macy's site, that's pretty much, whenever you click on the internet, on the network on your phone or device, your packets go through that building most likely. So we have a, what's called a cross connect out to the public internet via Brewster at the Internet Archive. Internet, Brewster and Ralph donated a one gig pipe to the public internet. So to your, your point, um, there are, we haven't really thought that far out, but there are possibilities to build a sort of a secondary network off that. As long as the sites that are connected via fiber all have electricity, the light can travel through those devices and get to Tuner Paul, assuming Tuner Paul is up and running. Um, but I think if you have, I think 
Rick sort of alluded to this, but if you really want to get more deep details about the internet and how it works, Tim clearly knows a whole lot. Tim has a very interesting project called SF Mix. SF Mix is a nonprofit peering fabric, and peering is basically making sure your packets of data don't leave the building to go to Netflix, but they go through another cabinet that have a connection between the two sites. So peering is, I think, a really interesting you know, next step of this. Um, anyway, I'd be glad to talk more about this um, at the break. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Mike. Rick, that is the first lifeline I've ever had a speaker <laughs> call. That's fantastic. Um, thank you so much. Uh, so the evening is going to continue. Um, Rick, I would like to give you uh, one of our Long Now Challenge coins to oh thank you for speaking tonight. <laughs> <laughs>